Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about the leader problem, or more particularly, my leader problem. And I admit it freely. It's my psychological debility, and this talk is going to be something of a confessional. I have a problem with leader, or more particularly, I have a problem with songs. And, and the problem stems from the, the, the difficulty we have in our language and discourse and culture in mixing style and form, right? I mean, now a song as a musical object has a certain form normally. It is a small, generally speaking, we're not talking about Der Abschied and Das Lied von der Erde. I mean, we're talking in generalities. It's a small, lyrical, poem or text set to music, usually in some type of strophic form, although some can be through composed, some can have, you know, A, B, some can do different kinds of things formally, but most of them will be in some vision of strophic forms, and they'll last anywhere from under a minute to maybe three to five minutes if you're pushing it, Two, three minutes is probably an average. Now, I don't really like songs. I mean, I don't dislike songs. What I mean is, when I listen to songs, I prefer to listen to contemporary songs. I, I have no reason to listen to classical songs because they're not any better than contemporary songs. And that's the problem, you see, because the culture, the classical music culture that has grown up around leader is trying to give them this sort of mystique about how fabulously wonderful they are. But they're just songs. And the greatest contemporary songs are every bit as good as the greatest Schubert songs or the greatest Hugo Wolf songs or the greatest songs by anybody. There is very little difference, formally speaking, in terms of what the thing is musically between a binchois chanson from the God knows what century Binchois lived in, the 15th century, the 16th century, and a song by Led Zeppelin or hip hop or any other kind of song because they're all doing the same thing and they're all doing the same thing basically in the same way. I also find most song texts to be just annoying. They're usually about love, and the absence of love, or suffering from love, or too much love, or, you know, I, I like songs that are about other things, you know, like housework, for example, or cooking, or, or going somewhere. I mean, one of the wonderful things about Schubert, as well as Lennon McCartney, or Paul Simon, or any of the great songwriters in, in musical history is that they write songs about life, about everything. Bruce Springsteen, you know, there's, there's just no difference between them. And so the problem is that the classical music culture has to face the fact that a song is just a song. And in my own musical experience, you know, if I like a composer, then I, and that composer wrote songs, then I'll probably like their songs. Why? Because I like the composer, not because I care about songs per se. Most of us from our childhood encounter music in the form of a song. That's why it's so aggravating to all of us classical music people when people say, oh yeah, Beethoven's Fifth, I know that song. And you just grind your teeth and go, it's not a song, it's a symphony. God damn it, don't you know the difference? You know because most people refer to all music as songs because that's what they experience. Popular music is the song. There is nothing else. There are no larger forms. There are no contrapuntal forms. You don't hear them in any other way other than songs. So music is a song. It's the same, it's the same equivalence, right? But, but then you deal with the classical music leader cult. And this is something that I have never understood. I would much rather hear Schubert songs sung by pop singers, by people without trained voices. They don't require them for the most part. They require decent voices, obviously, but I have no, I don't believe that a trained singer has anything to bring to the party particularly other than a stylized and affected technique that the music doesn't require. And often 
it, it often doesn't help the music to sing them in that way. I mean, I remember reading, you know, in Elizabeth Schwarzkopf's autobiography about doing Hugo Wolf. I mean, Hugo Wolf, of course, wrote art songs of the most rarefied style. I, they drive me crazy personally. I can't stand them. But, you know, she talked about how, oh, each song is a little gem and they're so subtle and sophisticated that every single note requires its own individual expression. And when we recorded the Italianisches Liederbuch, we, we, we made five billion takes and spliced them all together with hubby Walter Lega. And, you know, and I was like, oh, God, get off your high horse, lady. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And I don't. I, I, she, I'm sure she did it that way because she sounds like she did. She was the most affected singer that ever lived. I mean, so sure, every note had its own interpretive slant and it's unlistenable in my point of view. But I would rather listen to a hip hop definterizer than Fisher D. Scout any day. I personally think D. Lyerman, which is the ultimate song of urban alienation, would work fabulously with slightly updated, uh, shall we say, um, you know, lyrics and and a rhythm track on the bottom and then just this spooky do 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 you know how it goes. I mean, you know, these pieces have wonderful potential to be reimagined and reinterpreted. And I have no problem with people doing that because songs are just songs. I mean I I I, I saw two leader abends Abend, you know, Liederabend, you know, they, say, they don't even call song recitals song recitals anymore. You have to use the German because it sounds more sophisticated. A Liederabend, a song evening, even when it's in Mittag, in the afternoon, you go see the song. Anyway, so I, I mean, I saw this one song recital where they were doing Schumann's Frauenliebe und Leben. Oh, God, what an odious piece of crap that thing is. I mean, you know, first of all, the singer, the lady, came in, she had her hair pulled back in a bun that was so tight, it was like her face was going to split open. And she was wearing this austere white dress. You know, she was making sure, and it's just like Anna Russell. Remember when Anna Russell said leader singers never learn the words of the lead, but carry them up on the platform written in a little book? What she meant was that they all sing with their hands clasped like this. And when, when you know, especially when it's emotional and they cla they clench and Anna Russell would, would, would do a fake lead, you know, and, and she'd have her hands like this and then she'd like, <laughs> like this, like, you know, there are the words in the little book, you know, she'd like, whoop, flip, turn the page, you know. <laughs> that was her vision of leader singers' mannerisms. Well, there was a lot of that going on. And Frauenliebe und Leben is a text which is so offensive that I don't understand how any woman could possibly sing it. You know, my husband is my everything. When he's happy, I'm thrilled. When he's sad, I want to crawl under a rock and die. I want to hide myself from the sun. I live for him. I live for him my whole life. All my joy and my dreams are caught up in his, in his hubbiness. And oh God, it's, and then of course he dies, right? I mean, hubby, he dies, and sort of later on in the cycle. And of course, in order to do the death song, you know, she turned and she faced the piano, you know, and she, she grabbed the piano. She had clenched the piano and tucked her head in like this. And so she had to, you know, get herself into the appropriate frame of mourning. And then she slowly turned around and started singing, Oh, he's dead. I'm nothing. How can I go on? My life is empty and meaningless and pointless and 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 it's all just just terribly awful and oh, it was it was so embarrassing. I, it was just horrible. But what was horrible was the the pretension of the whole thing. You know, just the the, the insufferable self-importance <laughs> that these people have. That it was just, it was so off-putting. And then on the next evening, there was another leader up and with a totally different singer who came, you know, who showed up, you know, kind of wackily dressed. And she did this wonderful mishmash of songs from like three centuries. And it was fabulous. She was happy. She was relaxed. We enjoyed it. We could sing along if we wanted to. You know, she did Schubert and Poulenc and French and English. And so, so, you know, there will, there will always be songs that are wonderful, but you, you have to, you have to understand what they are, what the medium is. It was supposed to be, even Schubert's were supposed to be casual gatherings of friends in informal circumstances. And 
a great song a great song consists of the same thing i mean decent words that mean something hopefully a singable tune and you know an attractive and attractive setting that somehow supports the meaning of the text doing that is not terribly difficult and it's been done for at least five or six hundred years and one of them is much like the other and because i am a contemporary human being when i want to listen to music in large forms like symphonies and when i have to go to where the symphonies are which you know they're not being written by popular music groups for the most part they really aren't but when i want a song i would much prefer to hear the turtles do happy together than i would fisher t scow sing die schöne, Müller, die schöne Müllerin. i mean it just it just doesn't do it for me and so i really think i really think that one of the signal issues is that because a song is just a song you know, because they're all basically the same and they all have the same little form and they all try to do the same things. The classical music universe, which of course has to continually congratulate itself about how important it is and how fabulous it is and how there's never enough support and, and how entitled it is, uh, you know, is nowhere more offensively snobbish and, and ridiculous ridiculous and off-putting than when it comes to leader because basically they're bullshitting there's no difference between what they're doing and what and what Simon and Garfunkel or or you know any other any other twisted sister I mean take your pick Abba who cares it's all the same stuff and theirs is no different from anyone else's it's only a question of quality a question of musical quality and there's no guarantee that just because something is old it has that quality or just because it's a song by some famous composer it's better than a song by some other guy and and but they can't tell you that and they can't tell you that so so there it's this isn't a musical quality at all it's a cultural phenomenon it's it's an aesthetic act it's a pose, it's a game to try and persuade you that the lead or the chanson, the melody, whatever you want to call it, is this incredibly rarefied, you know, important, significant artistic thing. And it isn't. I'm telling you right now, it's not. It can be in certain circumstances, but I don't believe that the way these things are usually presented, even the songs that are written by the Hugo Wolfs of the world for professional singers with you know, trained voices, and a lot of them are, they became so, let's put it that way, as the 19th century wore on, songs became more a professional thing. And of course, when you have songs with in orchestral settings as opposed to just piano accompaniments, then obviously you're going to need professionally trained voices to do them because you need to do them in an orchestral setting and that's where you find orchestras when you're doing other classical things. So I get all that, I really do. But in my, in my opinion, the best way to hear a song is the way that the great songwriters of the early Romantic period intended them, which is sung at home with friends um, around the piano and performed by people who are just there to sing. And, and have a relaxed and pleasant environment and you know and, and, and enjoy the immediacy of the moment not to have these these crazy you know highfalutin elevated attempts at at artistic pretense anyway that that's my feeling about leader generally about songs I, I wish that popular artists particularly would take a look at these things and and adapt them, do things with them, because some of them are wonderful. They make great covers. <laughs> they do. They make great covers. You could do a Schubert song. You just give it a rhythm and give it a rhythm track and, you know, diddle the accompaniment and go to it, you know? That's the way I frankly would probably prefer to hear them most of the time. I have no problem with that at all. And I just wanted to throw this out there as a little bit of food for thought, and in particular to stress that we, we, we may have some clarity in making the distinction between a style, which is rock, hip-hop, early romantic, post-classical, 
impressionist, whatever you want. These are just styles. They don't have anything to do with form. And the form is what matters. The form is what determines what the thing is, not, you know, the notes that the that the composer chooses to express the form. And songs are just songs. So let's keep on listening for that elusive quality, the natural, unaffected, enjoyable song that's done the way it's meant to be done in a casual, enjoyable way, the way pop music does songs, not the way we hear them in most classical settings. Thank you. Take care.